so good morning to all the dignitaries and the participants i welcome you all to the first session on fourth day of aict atl sponsored faculty development program on atmospheric remote sensing methods and advances to share his insights on data assimilation of satellite observations we have with us dr govindan guti who is currently working as a associate professor at the indian institute of space science and technology trivandrum he received his phd from the indian institute of technology garakpur subsequently he has worked as a research associate at the university of oklahoma usa he has many research experience many years of experience in data assimilation on numerical weather prediction models ranging from global to regional scales and published several research articles in peer reviewed journals he has been involved in the development of a hybrid version of data assimilation system for the national center for environmental prediction usa his expertise also extends to tropical cyclone modeling and ensemble predictability of extreme weather events sir all the participants are eagerly looking forward to hear from you i welcome you sir for delivering the lecture over to you sir thank you vibin for that nice introduction i hope i am audible correct yes sir all right and i would also like to thank uh, dr ram rao and professor chandrashekar for uh, giving me an opportunity for this presentation i'll share my screen now good morning participants so i will be talking about uh data simulation of satellite observations so uh the outline of my presentation be just like this i'll just give a, a brief introduction on numerical weather prediction if i understand correctly professor chandrashekar has already has taken one class on atmospheric modeling i'll just give a brief introduction on numerical weather prediction model then uh, uh, i'll talk about initial condition sensitivity then which provides the motivation for doing data simulation then data simulation in theory and practice and uh, how do we use data simulation uh, for uh, for assimilating satellite observations so and the challenges involved in assimilating satellite observations will be discussed this is the outline uh, if you have issues in in listening to me i mean i hope i'm audible just put that in the chat box please let me know okay uh, so with this i'll start my presentation uh, i'll st I'll, i'll begin uh, the presentation with two questions so the first question is that uh, do you know uh, that the satellite observation contribute for weather forecast i am pretty sure that most of you will have an uh, answer as yes because we are aware that the satellite observations has been routinely used to improve the weather forecast so if the answer is yes let's go to the second question do you know how the satellite observations are being employed for improving the weather forecast so for the second question most of you i'm presuming will have an idea that okay satellite observations are being used for weather forecast so this is like you will get regular satellite pictures from insat or any other satellite and the so called weather forecasters will sit and make detailed analysis of this cloud pictures or satellite pictures and come up with an intelligent guess for what is going to be happening tomorrow forecast is something which is which is which is which is to be happen in tomorrow right or or day after tomorrow or in the future so that that may be a, an idea of a, a general person who who thinks that this this is how the satellite observations are being used just by analyzing the satellite pictures and getting the forecast for the future but if that was your answer then that's not the answer that's that's not that's not right so the objective of this presentation is to guide you through how the satellite observations are being used for improving the weather forecast and that's how we bring in the data simulation into picture okay so let's begin uh so what's an nwp model 
NWP model means it's a numerical weather prediction model. As the name states, it's numerical weather prediction. So, which basically it is based on uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the equations which governs a fluid, any fluid, but in this case, it's atmosphere. We can apply the same set of equations for oceans also, because our ocean is also a fluid. So, so we have a set of equations, dynamical equations, and once we solve these equations, we are going to get the forecast. That, that's what we call as a numerical weather prediction. The mathematical equations has a characteristic. So it's, it's basically, it's, it's PDEs or partial differential equations, and the equations are nonlinear. So when we attempt to solve this uh, nonlinear PDEs, so we will have problems because this, is, this does not have an analytical solution. So when we don't have analytical solution, we have to resort to numerical methods, okay? So, so we solve this equations numerically and hence the name numerical weather prediction, okay? So we solve this dynamical equations numerically to get the forecast of the future. That's what we call as an NWP model. So data simulation is actually something which pertains to NWP model. NWP model has an issue. So these data simulation used to correct that issue. Okay, let's see what uh, what that is. So before that, this are, are the dynamical equations. You don't have to pay attention to this equation, just to you know get as a representative thing. I'm just going to show how uh, the equations looks like. So we 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 basically have the fundamental equations of conservation of momentum, conservation of mass, and conservation of energy equations. So these are nonlinear PDs, and so we we are actually solving these equations uh, numerically. And when we do numerical solutions, we have to discretize that in terms of space and time. So that means these equations are not solved, are solved in regular grid points, as you can see in the left, left hand side of the figure. So we can see that this is basically the entire globe is actually divided into grid points. And these solutions are done in each of those grid points to get the forecast of the future. So these grid points are not two dimensional, it is three dimensional. It has X y and is a direction that means the vertical direction also so the so the grid points are, 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 are uh, is having is having a three-dimensional structure okay so that's how we obtain the forecast for the future so let's give a, 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 an idea about space discretization for example so let's say th th there are three points you can see in this three grid points a b and c so a b and c carries meteorological variables. U, V, and W represents the wind vectors in three different directions, okay? East, west, north, south, and vertical. And uh, it, it also has pressure, it, ha it has temperature, it has this humidity. And the values differ for different grid points. So, uh, so this is an example. So I, so I wanted to find out the gradient of pressure at the point B, dp by dx, which is given on the top. So how do we apply this? How do we get this? How do we numerically solve this? We use we can use finite difference method. That's not the only way. There are other ways also. But uh, here I'm using the finite difference method, in which I I take the pressure of at the point C. I take the pressure. I know the pressure of point A. So and we know that this is separated by a distance of delta x. So if you if you need to calculate dp by dx, so we simply they take the difference of BC at the, the pressure at point C minus pressure at point A divided by the total distance covered. So that, that's going to give you an approximate value of do, do, dp by, do p by do x, or, or the pressure gradient. It's, it's going to give you an approximate value. Let's look at the right-hand side of the figure. You can see two lines in this. The y-axis represents the pressure, and the x-axis represents the distance of three point A, B, and C. So the blue line is actually the signal. Okay, you can see a point of B, that's, that's the truth, which is actually, and, and the dashed line is something which we have calculated just using the finite difference uh, equations. So you can see that the, the one which we have calculated is actually a straight line, straight la dashed line, but the actual signal is, is having a different shape. Okay, so, so we, are, we are getting an approach. What does this mean? This means that we are, when we do this approach, when we do this finite difference method, we are going to get an approximate solution. We are not going to get the exact solution. So how do we improve this? If you reduce the delta x, if you make bring the grid points more and more closer, uh, the signals become slowly visible. So when you you are decreasing the uh, you know uh, the the distance of the uh, grid points, 
uh, you are going to get your, your, your sorry just a second so you when you when you reduce the distance uh, you you are the, the, that means that the resolution is going to be higher uh, so when the higher the resolution you require higher computation i'll i'll just show you a, a figure uh, just look at this figure just with with different a number of grid points so the grid points are is, is, is increasing with respect to uh, each of this time so you can you can see that the signals are becoming more and more visible when the grid points are are closer and closer so this is just like a pixel in your photograph if you increase the pixel you are going to get uh, uh, you know a, a clear signal okay so so incre but increasing the uh, grid point increasing the number of grid points actually amounts to actually uh, increasing the computation power you require more computation power for doing that so how much computation uh, requirement is there how do we calculate it so we have a computer time which is doing which is which is for each operations so we can just do a simple calculations computer time per operations multiplied by operations per equations so we have several equations like let's say it's the five equations so and each equations needs to be solved in each of these grid points so that is multiplied by equations per each grid points multiplied by total number of grid points and which is multiplied by each time step of the simulation so that's that's something which is going to give you the total computational time okay so let's do an, a, a calculation for this I'm, I'm just assuming that we have a, a 100 kilometer uh, resolution global model uh, and a 100 kilometer resolution global model will have approximately 500 you know grid points in uh, in uh, east direction 200 grid points approximately in north south direction and almost like 64 levels so multiplying this you will get almost like 64 lakh grid points and that's for one equation so you, you need to solve five equations approximately so so this 64 lakhs multiplied by five is going to give you a, 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 a computations which is of the order of 10 raised to 7 so what is the degree of freedom of a model a, a, a NWT model it is of the order of 10 raised to 7 so it's, it's huge and so for a 100 kilometer resolution you will get the you have to set, set the time step is approximately 600 seconds so if you set more than 600 seconds it will be computationally unstable so so if you do if you if you need to just say give a forecast for one day using a global model you have to do this 144 times you have to do computation 10 raised to 7 computations for 144 times to give get a forecast of one day so which means it, it's really it's a computationally ex, it's challenging and you cannot that also means that you cannot just run a, a atmospheric model in your in your desktop or maybe it, it may uh, in any workstation also you need to have a high performance computation for doing an nwp problem for solving an nwp problem and that that too for a very coarse resolution model so if you increase the number of grid points then this is going to increase many fold so so that's how uh, that that's ba the basic computation requirement for this so you know now the degree of freedom of uh, of a model is actually of the order of 10 raised to 7 so but so after doing all this suppose if you have enough computational resources and if you do all these calculations after doing this even now the weather is is unpredictable so what makes the weather unpredictable so so there are two fundamental reasons for that one the uncertainties uh, with respect to its initial conditions so it's a numerical model as i mentioned so you have equations which is which will be solved in numerical um, using numerical methods so this needs to be forced by initial conditions so we need initial conditions for that so uncertainties in the initial conditions can call is one of the source of nwp model the second one is the uncertainty of the model okay the model itself has some problems like like i mentioned before if the resolution is not adequate it's it's not going to give you the actual signal. So so that that's that's a model. That's a, that's another source is the model. Uh, model is model also gives you uncertainty. But suppose just for the time being, you assume that you have a very you have got a very perfect model. You have got a God given model with you, which works perfectly without any issues. So the question is that if you have such a model, is it possible <clears throat> to give uh, an accurate forecast of weather can you tell me what is going to happen tomorrow 
um, like in terms of precipitation or rainfall or, or in terms of any other weather parameters? So answer is, even if you have a very perfect model also, you will not get a perfect forecast. That's because you will have uncertainties in the initial conditions. And you must have heard of butterfly effect, which, which is, can be stated as when the present determines future, approximate present does not approximately determine the future. What does this mean? So suppose if you have a, a, a perfect or, or a near perfect representation of the initial conditions or, or the present situation, a near perfect, it is not perfect. And if you give a forecast using a forecast model, the forecast will not be near perfect. Your initial conditions was near perfect, but the forecast is not near perfect. The forecast is going to deviate a lot. And uh, that's because atmosphere or, or, or the weather is an unstable dynamical system. So the, the, the dynamics which, which governs the atmosphere is chaotic. It, so it is the chaotic systems are highly sensitive to initial conditions. Just because our problem, which is, which in, which is in our hand, is chaotic, is having chaotic dynamics, it is highly sensitive to initial conditions. Just to you know, reiterate this more, I'll just give, I'll just give you an example. Let's say we know the truth. Okay, truth is in this figure, the truth is represented as a black line. And the forecast from a model is represented as, uh, you know, uh, the red line. So we have an initial condition, which is represented by IC. You, you can see that the initial condition is slightly different from the truth. And when we start a forecast, the forecast will is actually giving you, a, say, a very cloudy atmosphere, okay, for future. So maybe if you give a forecast for tomorrow, the model actually tells you that uh, the the tomorrow it's going to be a, have a, we are going to have a cloudy weather, but let's look at the truth. The truth shows that it is a very sunny weather. So what what's what's wrong with that? By assuming that if the model is perfect, the problem has happened uh, uh, with the initial conditions. So there is a small deviation in the initial conditions, which has caused a you know. Uh, you know uh, that, that the, the model has evolved in a different directions and it, it gave a very wrong information about the future so so that's how the uh, the model so so just understand that uh, nwp model is highly sensitive to initial conditions so what do we do so now now we have we, we now we clearly understood what what is our problem okay so how do we solve this riddle we cannot just say that okay this is so we understood the problems and we cannot do anything about it and we cannot just keep waiting for that. So how do we solve this riddle? The answer comes in the form of data simulation. So data simulation is actually a process of optimally combining uh, the information from observations and the information from short range numerical forecast to get the best, better estimate of the state. That means you have observations, okay? You have initial conditions, which is, which is taken from the model forecast. So you combine these two, and correct the errors in the initial conditions using a method which is called as data simulation. And that's going to give you a product which is called as analysis. Analysis means the best estimate of the state. Okay, so which means the errors in the initial condition has been reduced by combining the model initial conditions with the observations using a data simulation scheme. And that's going to give you a better forecast. I'm not saying that a perfect forecast, it, it can slightly or it can it can improve your forecast to a certain extent. So what does data simulation do? Data simulation corrects the initial conditions. Why do we need to correct initial conditions? Because the, our, our, our model, our weather is a chaotic, uh, having chaotic dynamics. It is highly sensitive to initial conditions. So we need to correct uh, the initial conditions. So now let's give our focus to, so now the question is that where does the observation come from? All of a sudden you said there are observations. So where does this observation come from? We have various sources of observations, like from aircraft, weather ships, like satellites, weather radar, you know, um, then radio sondes, surface stations, so many observations. So the, the atmosphere is, is being constantly monitored with you know, all sorts of, uh, and, and, and we are bombarded with all this information. But there, is, there are issues with these uh, observations. The issues is that it is not you know, uniformly measured throughout the globe. So, for example, the southern hemisphere is the least observed uh, hemisphere because there is the population is less. So it is it is not uniform. Plus, 
the observations which you are getting is, is not in the same format. For example, weather radar is going to give you the information in the form of reflectivity or radial wind. Satellite is going to give you information in form of radiance, whereas the surface station or radio sunday is going to give you observations in terms of temperature and wind, which is easy to understand. So the observations are in you know highly heterogeneous and it is highly non-uniform. So it's a big task for us to combine these observations with the data simulation, with the, with the initial conditions. Initial conditions are in regular grid points. To solve an NWP problem, we need to have initial conditions at regular grid points. But observations are not in regular grid points and it is available in different formats. So that needs to be combined it's a big, it is being a challenging problem. So what is the goal of data simulation? To produce regular, physically consistent four dimensional representation of the state four dimensional means x y z that means uh, two directions in horizontal one direction vertical and and the time as well so four dimensional representation of the state of the atmosphere from a heterogeneous array of in situ and remote sensing observations which is sampled imperfectly and irregularly in space in in, in space and time so you can see in the bottom uh, figure the, the this is how the observation observations are highly irregular so data simulation does a purpose, and then this will be converted to uh, regular grid points, which is actually through which we can use the NWP models to solve uh, equations for the future or to get the forecast for the future. So that's that's the sole purpose of data simulation. Okay, so that's the goal of data simulation. So the current status it, it has all started from simple you know empirical methods like uh, simple function fitting. Then it slowly evolved into successive correction method, then Newtonian nudging, optimal interpolation. Then it, it becomes statistic, more and more statistical. From the empirical, it, it, has, it has evolved into statistical, then optimal interpolation. Then we then came the 3D war, three-dimensional variational codes, uh, data simulation system. Then it, it, it has evolved into four-dimensional variational data simulation system and ensemble Kalman filter system. And basically, now it has reached a stage of combining ensemble Kalman filter with uh, the variational system to get a hybrid data simulation system. So, so that's how it has evolved, and this is the current status of data simulation system, which is used uh, across the uh, operational centers across the globe. So, let me explain you. I mean, I, I'll be using a bit of mathematics over here because I tried to. Uh, I, I thought I'll just avoid it, but without this, I cannot explain the data simulation, you know, very clearly. So, so I'll just choose this as a scalar problem. We have a, we, we have a multivariate issue. So we, but we have just, just for the sake of understanding, I'll just solve the data simulation as a scalar problem. Uh, so the purpose of data simulation is, I'm re reiterating again and again, is to find out the best estimate of the state. Okay, so let's assume that you, in this figure, you can see that there is a you know, star which, which represents a location, any location, okay? Uh, and uh, you have, you want to know what is going, what is the temperature over that region? So there are two pieces of information you have. So I, I, I'll just, uh, you know, give this task to two different people. So two different people with two different instruments goes over to this, that place, location, and takes two different information. And this information does not match. match. So the first person returns to me and saying that, so the temperature over the over that location is T1. The second person returns to me with uh, saying that so the temperature over that location is T2. So I know that this both are wrong. There are there are some issues, there are some errors in that. Not completely wrong. It, it will be close to the truth, but it is not the truth. It is not the perfect truth. So, uh, so these two informations are different. So how do I know what is going to be the actual temperature in that in that place? Okay, so just repeat, we have two informations, T1 and T2, temperature information, which is taken by two different individuals using two different instruments. So I wanted to combine these two information to get the best estimate of the state or best estimate of the temperature of that location. So how do I do that? So this is the problem. Now, now the problem is clear to me. Now I will just uh, use my, probably my Pen and paper to. So what do we have? We have uh, T. T is basically the, the subscript represents the truth. So we have two information about the temperature. One uh, person one is going to give me is uh, told me that this is T one, and person two told me that it is T two. 
So I know that this these two informations are not right. This has some errors in it. So what is going to be T1 then? It is basically TT truth plus the error. Okay. What is going to be T2 is TT plus epsilon 2. So what is epsilon 1 and epsilon 2? Epsilon is nothing but the observational error. The errors which they make while taking the observation. Okay. So, so before beginning, so I, so I just want to find out uh, the best estimate of the state from this uh, two pieces of information. How do I do it? So we, I, for that, I have to make some assumptions. What are those assumptions? Is that one, the first assumption is that uh, this information which I got is unbiased, okay? Suppose the, the thermometer which is used to measure this temperature of that location is say, uh, is having some, is always records uh, a lower temperature, then that is biased. So, but my, I'm not, I'm assuming that it is unbiased. It is, it is only having random errors and it does not have a, a bias, bias in it. So if it is unbiased, then if I take several values over a given location, I can say that E expectation value of T1 is equal to E is equal to T2 is basically is equal to M. What is E here? E is nothing but the average of several observations. So E is the average of several observations. So if I take the mean of T1, mean of T2, and mean of the truth, which we don't know, will be M. I'm just assuming that that's the mean. It's going to be the same because it's unbiased. So if we take several measurements, it's going to be, we are going to get uh, the, uh, the mean, or same, same mean for both of both, all the three uh, uh, observations. So the second assumption which I'm going to make here is that errors are uncorrelated. Which means uh, if the expectation value of epsilon one, epsilon two is equal to zero, okay? And the third one is that I should know the variances of observation error. So what do you mean by variance? Suppose if you have a set of observations, x is equal to x1, x2, et cetera, up to xn, how do you find out the variance? You take the difference of xi minus x bar, which is the mean, squared divided by i is equal to one to n, divided by n. This is something which is going to give you the variance. So we know the, we should know the variance of uh, uh, the observation error, which states that e is equal to E of sigma one square is equal to E of epsilon one square is equal to sigma one square. E of epsilon two square is equal to sigma two square. Okay, we should know the variance of the observation error. So the goal is to find out the best estimate of the state from the two pieces of information. And so we have we have made, made this assumptions. There is a reason for making this assumption, which I'm not going to. Uh, say here because that, 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 that comes from the basic uh, mathematical assumptions, so I, which I'm not going to explain it here. But uh, this, in this way, we are going to get the just understand that this is going this is going to give you the best estimate of the CT. So we use a linear unbiased unbiased estimator for this for estimating the state. So which states that so when TT, to find out TT, what you need to do is, is simply it's a linear method. So A1 is a coefficient T1 plus A2 T2. So you got two information, T1 and T2. I just use a linear method, which is having coefficients of A1 and A2, uh, and combine this to get the best estimate of the state. So if you assume that this is unbiased, so expectation value of TT is equal to A1, expectation value of T1, expectation value is the average. So which is going to give you M is equal to A1 M plus A2 M, which, which tells you that A1 plus A2 is equal to one, okay? 
So we have got two equations here. One is this, <coughs> in which we have used linear methods. And the second one is by making it uh, linear unbiased. So we can make, we can, <coughs> from the assumption that it is unbiased, we can write this equation this form. So, oh, uh, and one more thing which we need to find out is the variance of T. That is the truth. T is the truth, which is something which we expecting, which means nothing but A1 T1 plus A2 T2. Remember what is the variance is? It is X minus X bar. So this can be like this. Okay. So finally, we can just from this, I can write that sigma t square is equal to a1 sigma 1 square, a1 square sigma 1 square plus a2 square. You can do the rest of these calculations, which is just simple maths. So you can, you can get the variance of the truth. So our purpose is to get the best estimate. What do you mean by best estimate? Best estimate means you have to find out a value, temperature value, in which sigma t square is minimum. Okay, that's the purpose. So you need to minimize this value with respect to A1 or A2 to find out uh, the best estimate of the state. That's, that's, that's what we call by best estimate. So how do we find out the minimum value? So it's just simply by differentiating this sigma t square with respect to a1. And we are equating this to zero. It can be a2 also. Uh, it doesn't matter. And finally, when we do this differentiation, we are going to get a1 sigma 1 square plus a2 sigma 2 square. Or, or maybe I'll write the final form of this. I'll just cut this off. So a1, we can just find out a1 is uh, sigma 2 square uh, divided by sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square. And a2 is equal to sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square plus sigma 1 square. OK? So that's what we got. So we, we have got the value of a1 and a2. So now it's easy. So we tt is we have already written as a1 t1 plus a2 t2. We know the value of t1. We know the value of t2. We have got what is going to be a1 and a2. So we are we can get the best estimate of the state, correct? And how, how did we derive it? By assuming that we are going to get the minimum variance. The assumption, underlying assumption is that this is basically unbiased. So I will rewrite this equation. Tt is equal to, I can just rewrite this equation in a different way, t1 plus sigma 2 square plus sigma 1 square plus sigma 2 square plus sigma 1 square. So I'm, I'm not doing the in between the steps, so I think it's, it's easy to, for you to do it. And you can just write that as t2 minus t1. See, so what you need to do is, if you have the value of t1, t2, and if you know the variances, you're going to get the truth of the state. Okay, so this is nothing but your Kalman filter equation. So you might have heard of Kalman filter. This is how a Kalman filter equation looked like. Let, let, me, let me introduce this in the form of, uh, of data simulation, from a data simulation perspective. So what did I say? We got two temperature information, t1 and t2. So, so in data simulation, as I mentioned before, we have two, info, two pieces of information. So one is from the model or initial conditions, or I'll, I'll say initial conditions, the information from initial condition. The second is the information from observation. So what do we do? We have two, we have two pieces of information. So we need to combine this. Combine this such that the, the com combined form is better than IC and better than observations. Okay, so so I, I'll just put I'll just remove one and two from here and write it in a proper data simulation uh, way. T1 
TT instead of replaced by TA, which is TA is the best state of uh, best estimate of the analysis, is equal to TB, which is the temperature from the first uh, uh, you know source or maybe the background. Background B represents the background or the initial conditions. This is how it is uh, uh, represented in data solution world, and uh, multiplied by W into TO minus TB. Okay. So now what do you got? You simply got uh, an equation, which is a straight linear equation, which basically get, gets you the best estimate of the state. What do you need? To, what, what do you want? You, you just need two information. One is from the initial condition. One is from the observations. Observation I put that as O. And what is W? W is nothing but sigma B square into sigma B square plus O square. So if you know the background, the variances, if you know the value of T0, if you know the value of TB, you are going to get the best estimate of the state. So that's how we combine. So, but there are there are some underlying assumptions. That's basically it is it should be unbiased, it should be linear. So this is basically your Kalman filter equation. So what does the Kalman filter equation do? Kalman filter equation is so we'll find out an optimal weight. Okay, that's that's the challenge here. Once you get the optimal weight, the rest is done. So you have two pieces of information. If you if you find out an optimal weight, you are going to get the best estimate of the state. Okay, Kalman filter is one method of uh, approach through which data simulation is done. Okay, there is another stream which is called as variational approach. So I'm not going to do all this derivation for that. But just I simply write down the equations in which uh, you can uh, say that there is a cost function which is called J, which is can be written as T minus TB, the whole square, into sigma B square plus T minus TO, the whole square, plus sigma O square. Okay, so this is one stream getting the optimal weight is one stream of data simulation. This is another stream, variational approach, in which here we are going to find out the minimum variance by minimizing this cost function. Okay, these are the two major streams through which data simulation is done. Some operational centers adopt Kalman filter, some operational centers adopt variational approach, some operational centers combine these two and get the best estimate of the state. So, but this is the fundamental you know, uh, rule in which we have to, the idea is to get the best estimate, which is better than the observations, which is better than the model. And I combine this so that we'll get the best estimate of the state. So when we improve the initial condition, the weather being a chaotic system, uh, as, as the initial conditions are better, the forecast will be better. So, so the, what is the final purpose? The final purpose is to, uh, is to get the better, get a better forecast by improving the initial condition. That's what a data simulation system do. So, so this this is uh, the problems are solved only for uh, scalar problems. So this is this is easy to understand. But just remember that uh, I have already shown that the degree of freedom of a model is of the order of ten raised to seven. The observations which you are getting from all the sources is of the order of ten raised to six. So you cannot just work with this. These are the examples for one scalar problem. But we are we are just dealing with a multi-dimensional system. So uh, we have to have a different form. Uh, for uh, for doing data simulation for uh, in in a real world, so you can see how the equation has changed. For example, the first equation we see, x a, which is the analysis, is is equal to x b plus k. This is the k is the Kalman gain is minus y minus h x. I'll explain all those terms later. So, but the purpose is to find out the k. So this all this rest of the formulations are just to you know how to how we are estimating the Kalman gain for this equation. Okay, so so the assumptions all remains the same uh, only that only thing is that this is in, in a multi-dimensional uh, system this is how it looks like and in variational assimilation uh, the the cost function will be like this uh, there are two terms in this equation the first one is a background term the, the 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 one which is on the left hand side is the cost function our purpose is to minimize the cost function uh, two terms on the right uh, right hand side the first term represents the background term the second term represents the observational term so the background term, for example, for instance, XB is basically the background or the, or the initial condition field. Uh, and X is the analysis. X minus XB is the, what we call as analysis increment. And you have noticed that the, uh, the variance become covariance in when we, when we deal with the 
multivariate statistical problem. Okay, and on the observational term is on the extreme right, so which which has two. Uh, I'll just explain you what this variable is. Y represents the observations. Any observations. It can be satellite observations. It can be radio sonde observations. And H X H is an operator. You can see on the figure here. Uh, we know that the the initial conditions are in regular grid point, but the observation does not exactly fall over the uh, location. So it can fall in in a place which is far away from the grid point. So H is basically an operator which interpolates the x values to the observation location. Sometimes it is interpolator, but when we do satellite assimilation, satellite data assimilation, H is uh, H will be nonlinear because H will act as a forward uh, model. Okay, I'll, I'll just explain that later. But just understand that the second term, the second uh, in, uh, the term in this equation, which is the H, is basically an operator. Operates on X, which is the analysis, to interpolate it sometimes, uh, or to convert one form of data into another form of data, so that it matches with the observations. Okay. So there is another set of uh, assimilation, uh, another method of assimilation, which is hybrid data assimilation, which actually combines the ensemble Kalman filter with the variational data assimilation. Also, uh, in this we can uh, we, the, the, you can see that the terms have become three instead of two. The middle term actually is is brings in the effect of Kalman filter in this uh, data assimilation system. So I am not going to all this. Just understand that, that there are various methods. A variational approach and uh, ensemble Kalman filter probabilistic approach is one on uh, two major streams and there is a there are uh, data simulation systems exist to which which actually incorporates the effect of both of this okay uh, just to, I'll just conclude so uh, what does a data simulation procedure looks like so we have observations okay that observations are, are from different sources as I mentioned before some raw data checks are done so then observational increments are calculated Another piece of information comes from a short range forecast, which is basically the initial condition. And uh, that, that, is, that has been provided. So then after quality control, uh, objective analysis is done. Objective analysis is nothing but data simulation in which uh, the initial conditions are corrected and, and a new initial condition is generated, which is supposed to be the best. As we have seen, it is, it is this, this estimate is, is, the, is the, which, it's the one which is better than observations, better than the short range forecast. Now it is it is fed into the forecast model, uh, which is a dynamical model, which is a chaotic model, and initial conditions are now better, so which gives you a better forecast than without doing that assimilation. Okay, so now a next short range forecast is uh, generated, and thus that forms the initial conditions for the next cycle or or the future cycle, which is again done in a cyclic process. This is how a data assimilation uh, procedure is done in in an operational weather center. So now let's come to the uh, satellite observations. Uh, how do we assimilate satellite observations? So there are different types of satellite observations. One maybe is active, uh, which is uh, bouncing off signals from of something. Like examples are uh, the, the the sensor sends out the signal and it, it is receiving it back. So examples are uh, wind lidars, cloud radars, scatter scatterometry, and all these ex are the examples for uh, active sensors. And the passive sensors, which actually measures uh, the observations, are, are is something in which uh, it receives the signal from the source. It is not sending out signals. So examples are visible instruments. You know, you you daily newspapers. You see the satellite pictures, which is actually uh, is from a passive source. Okay, IR example and microwave uh, images and all these things are examples for uh, passive sensors. And uh, there are also other type of satellite observations, such as uh, GPS uh, radio occultations, uh, in which uh, you have a series of GPS uh, satellite observations, uh, satellites, and GPS actually, this radio occultations actually gives you the refractivity of the atmosphere. Okay, it is not it, it, all these things. The satellite or GPS does not directly measure what what exactly we want. We want the variables in wind, temperature. You know, humidity, etc. But we are not getting the observations in wind temperature, humidity. We, that each of the satellites is going to give you uh, the observations in different, you know, formats. Uh, so, what does a satellite measure, for instance? It is actually not. It is measuring the upwelling radiations. It's going to give you how much is the uh, the radiation intensity of radiation it, it, we are going to have. So, it's the which which has a unit of what per meter square. So, so we have if we have to derive the information 
which we want like in temperature etc from this uh, radiance observations from the intensity of uh, observations or, or, or from the intensity so how do we do that in when when we do a simulation we need we, we have we have seen this term y minus hx so y and hx and this term the second term should have the same units you cannot have you cannot take a difference of uh, a value from what in what per meter square minus the model variable so you need to have both in same units so that's where the h is brought in the y is for example if you are doing satellite uh, simulation of observation satellite observations gives you the radiance uh, which is nothing but the intensity of the radiation which is being emitted by the observers so you but your model is is going to have the variables in the form of wind temperature humidity etc so you need to have an operator which operates such that the model variables are are getting converted to radians so so h is now an operator it is a nonlinear operator it is not just an interpolation operator also it, it is a nonlinear operator it actually converts the model variables which is in regular meteorological variables to the satellite data which is in the form of radians or or maybe in the form of reflectivity in the case of radar or in the case of refractivity in the case of the gps radio occultation so h does all these things and at that time h is called as a forward model okay h acts as a forward model forward model is is a, 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 is, a, is, a, is 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 a set of function which actually uh, takes in the meteorological parameters and convert that in the form of radiances okay so that's that's what we call as forward model uh, which is important when we do satellite data simulation uh, so and when we do satellite data simulation, the most important thing which we need to care about is the bias correction. All observations has biases, but it is especially important in the case of satellite observation, satellite radiance, because in the in the case of satellite observations, the signal, the the noise can be sometimes greater than signal. So it, it, that is something which we need to be really careful when we when we do a simulation for using satellite radiance, we need to do bias corrections. Biases come from satellite instruments from the characterization calibration of the satellite instrument or it biases can also come from the ready to transfer model the ready to transfer model or the forward model is is basically a nonlinear model so it's, it's it's not a perfect model it has it also has a lot of assumption in it so it is not going to give you a perfect radiance it also has biases so this biases uh, from the ready to transfer model contributes for the biases in the uh, in the satellite observations and also our, our model is not a perfect thing the model also has a lot of errors so that will also bring in biases so all these biases needs to be corrected before it is to be assimilated in the model then another problem challenge in this is basically uh, thinning and superobing so satellite observations are you know really dense over a place so so we need we we, we cannot assimilate all these observations together because this can in fact induce a lot of noises in the in in, in the output or in the analysis so we have to reduce thin these observations um so it can in fact reduce noises it can actually reduce uh, correlated errors and it can also reduce the computational expenses that's another challenging problem in in, in satellite data simulation so the major challenges when we do satellite data simulation is basically uh, is the challenge with the forecast model how to deal with the forecast uh, sorry the for forward model uh, which converts the model variables into the radiances then we need to perform bias corrections and thinning and another major issue is the observational errors observational errors in the data simulation system are assumed to be uncorrelated but in the case of satellite data simulation uh, if you assume the observational errors are uncorrelated then it's it's going to be it's going to cause a lot of noises in the in your uh, initial conditions so future of uh, satellite data simulation assimilation is is now a lot of researchers are going on in assimilating frown and precipitation directly traces trace gases and aerosol directly apart from the you know the basic meteorological variables uh, all these parameters can be directly assimilated plus uh, ocean data simulation so ocean variables also needs to be incorporated to get a better seasonal forecast so and most of the researchers are now uh, are done on bias correction uh, and improved methods for thinning and superobing and improved representation of surface parameter which is especially important for microwave uh, radiance assimilation so this is the future of data simulation so just in case if you are interested in, in doing any any work on satellite uh, data simulation as such you can visit this page wrf 
DI user page, you it, it has uh, you know all this codes which is for da data simulation. It has uh, the ensemble Kalman filter code, the variational code, variational assimilation code. Plus, it it also has uh, you know the methods to it also explains you in detail how to perform data simulation and all those things. Uh, you can visit this page if you have any interest in. And that's all. If you have any questions uh, which needs to be asked uh, to me personally, you can just mail me, going at iast.ac.in. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, maybe they will put questions on um, chat. Is that okay, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is there any questions? So, yeah, I can so see. We some have a question, sir, from a question from Daniel Simon. Why say he's saying that I see that models perturb initial condition. That means even after having assimilated initial condition, while giving operational prediction and they use different method to do so. Which method do you think is best while initializing the model? Okay, uh, initializing the model, I don't know, he mean by saying data simulation. As of now, the best in method for initializing the model is, if I understand correctly, uh, is for for dimensional variational data simulation system. I mean, there are, I mean, uh, there may be, you know, difference in opinion. But I, what I've what I've noticed is that uh, it's it's, uh, it's basically uh, the uh, 4 d war is is supposed to be the best one for, for initializing the model. Uh, so if that is what he meant, uh, he has written perturb initial condition and all. So I am not very sure is that what he really meant. Uh, so one more question from Riswan. Uh, he was asking, how do we differentiate when the data is modeled as ergodic? Or evol uh, evolutionary. Uh, that is modeled as ergodic and evolutionary. I, I actually I don't know the answer for that. I, uh, I don't know what exactly he meant by ergodic and evolutionary. So I don't, I don't know the answer for that. Okay, Jayant, he is asking for minimizing the error. Which method is the best? As, as uh, that's what that's the answer I have already given. I think the 4D war is uh, supposed to be the best. Ensemble Kalman filter is also equally good. Uh, provided ensemble Kalman filter requires ensembles for calculating the covariance. So the larger the number of ensembles, uh, the better it, it will be. So if you have more computational resources, ensemble Kalman, my assumption is that ensemble Kalman filter will work as good as 41. Sir, can I ask one question? Yeah, please. Yeah, uh, so very nice talk, sir. Uh, but Thank I you. you new to this uh, data uh, assimilation. I'm a oh. radar meteorologist. How a radar data can be assimilated is uh, just okay. I would... Radar data again. Uh, the, prob the problem with the assimilation of the radar data is. Uh, are you are you working on data assimilation? Uh, uh, no, I, we want to do because we have a cloud, first Indian cloud radar. So okay. we are taking great, a very great. good cloud vertical structure using a reflectivity profile. So okay. We want to know. I want uh, they... to just start. Two ways. One, 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 one is that uh, you, if you have methods to convert the, the what information you have, cloud, right? Yes. Uh, okay. So if you can convert that uh, in in the form of regular meteorological variable, say in the form of humidity. Okay. So if you can derive the humidity from that uh, the information which you are getting from the radar, you can assimilate it directly without much issue. So to start with, you can do that. The second approach is that you can directly assimilate. Uh, the uh, the vertical column of cloud or whatever it is. I, I don't know what, what exactly that is, the parameter that is. So, but for that, you need to construct the operator which actually converts the model variables to uh, the, uh, the, the, the information which you want. So as far as radar is concerned, we usually get, you may be getting reflectivity, correct? Yes. And radial wind, okay? Yes. If you're getting reflectivity and radial wind, you can assimilate it directly. So the page which I have shown uh, this WRF DA, so that that has uh, 3D war, 4D war systems which is available. That has uh, you know uh, capability of directly assimilating uh, radar data. So they have clearly mentioned what you need to do with the radar data. So you have to make the radar data in a particular form. You don't have to do any any you know, operations inside it. You, they just expect the radar data in a particular form. You have to convert that into a particular form, which is actually acting as your observation. And you have uh, an initial condition model, which 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 needs to be generated from the model. 
you can assimilate directly using without any much without much difficulties because as of now 3d war and 4d war is having radar assimilation capability thanks a lot sir uh, for your uh, very nice explanation i think uh, as i'm new i can uh, um, maybe in a time i can learn this thank you very much maybe i can contact you sir thank you yeah definitely yeah excellent sir sir we have a question from vijay lakshmi okay finite difference or finite volume method which is easier in computational for weather prediction different methods are have different advantages uh, in most of our models or uh, regional models we use finite difference method it has its own advantage okay praveen is asking what is the computational time for data assimilation let's say for the next days forecast uh it depends on how many observations you have and what uh, it's uh, it depends upon the resolution you have for us it will take i mean uh, for 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 a research purpose it will take you know few minutes in in our hpc correct yeah so dr roy is asking for lightning data simulation which method will give best estimate i have never worked with lightning data data simulation so i have no idea about that but i i am assuming that 3d war uh, may perform 3d war or 4d war may perform better for uh, so it it is always better to use 4d war method than ensemble kalman filter method when you are assimilating non conventional observations okay sir thank you sir no more questions okay thank you so thank you for the informative talk about data assimilation sir sir well explain how data assimilation will improve the models thank you sir thank you so thank you all uh, we will be back Uh, up the break by 11:30